Uh, my name is Rachel Scott. I'm an OVAC board member and second year at Owen. Um, I've always been passionate about entrepreneurship from seeing my family grow their business and I'm just really excited to be a part of today. And super excited to introduce our closing keynote speaker who has traveled all the way from Denver, Colorado to be here today. Um, we're grateful to have Jerome Edwards and his son Christian here with us today. Jerome Edwards is the co-founder and CEO of Cardio Next Incorporated. Jerome studied computer science and electrical engineering at the Colorado School of Mines and began his career as a software programmer for surgical navigation technologies, a company that was acquired by Medtronic. Jerome then attended business school at Vanderbilt Owen and concentrated in finance. While at Owen, he founded Viren Medical Technologies, which was acquired by Olympus Corporation for $340 million. Jerome is back at home just outside Boulder, Colorado, working on his building, working on building Cardio Next, which I know he will share more about shortly. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Jerome. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Do we have the slides here? Do I get to see them here too, or? No? All right, I'll stand somewhere over here then. <laughs> um, all right, so um, A Pirate's Life for Me, I'm sort of a provocative um, title, right? It's, but it's, it's less provocative than, um, than, than you would imagine. So let's, let's get into it, you know. So it really comes from uh, this, this quote by Steve Jobs, right? It's more fun to be a, a pirate than to join the Navy. And, and that's, um, you know, it, it's, you can almost substitute uh, startup for the word pirate and sort of large company or big company or multinational company uh, for the word Navy, right? So I think that there's really some um, significant, significant advantages um, to, uh, to being a small company you know, or being a small team. You can do a lot as a small team, surprisingly, that, that you can't do when, when you're in a big company and a big you know, multinational corporation and, and everything, you have to, everything you do you know, has to go through a stage gate process. If you want to build something and just try it out, you know, you, you've got to get uh, approval from R&D and engineering and, and uh, marketing and sales and, and you know, all sorts of approvals just to build something and try it, right? And, and that the, you know, process, I think, uh, can sometimes be the death of innovation. You know? So sometimes the, the, the best um, sort of environment for, uh, for innovation to really you know, grow is in, in a less process-oriented you know, environment. And uh, Clay Christensen used to, you know, wrote, wrote a lot about this in, in the book, The Innovator's Dilemma. Right? So, so really, that's, that's the concept that I'm, I'm trying to get to here, is that um, you know, a startup in, in, in a pirate ship can be a lot, lot of fun. You know, and, and there's a reason that startups exist. You know that that and truly, startups should be a place for innovation. Uh, and, and similarly, you know, there's there's a there's a reason that the special forces and the SEAL teams exist, as well as as the Navy, right? So there's there's different um, sort of um, uh, opportunities and, and capabilities that a very small, tight knit. Um, a group of individuals can can do things that are almost uh, unfathomable, um, you know, when when they're working together and, and and doing things. So that's really what this whole you know pirate's life for me. I, I prefer that environment, you know, that uh, as as little process as possible. That's that's the way I like to think about things and and really sort of drive uh, innovation. So so that's why I'm wearing a suit and not like an eye patch or anything. You know, it's it's. Uh, um, it's, it's more about that concept than it is about um, pirates and ships. So my core competency is um, taking computers and using them in surgery. You know, so uh, think of it as like GPS for the human body. 
um, using um, software and uh, tracking systems to bring image data, uh, information about the patient into the surgery theater, uh, into the cath lab, and then couple that with some sort of tracking system, uh, instruments, uh, you know, needles and drills and forceps and, and uh, catheters, put sensors in them, and then register that to the uh, image data and let you, let the physician, let the surgeon, let the um, uh, uh, cardiologist sort of see what's going to be ahead of them or what's around them um, as they're introducing an instrument into the human body to deliver therapy. That's, that's really what I've uh, been doing since I was 21 years old, you know, writing code and building systems for, for those types of clinical applications. And, you know, so, I, gosh, I've been doing this for 23 years now. Um, so uh, it, it's, you know, and we've, we've done it in different applications. We've done it in brain surgery, then we've done it in spine surgery and uh, lung, and now um, the heart. But that's, that's really my core competency is, is, is doing this image-guided surgery, GPS for uh, the human body. And I think that now we're at a really exciting time where, um, you know, AI and machine learning are uh, really we're starting to see the possibilities uh, with that more and more. And I think we're using AI and machine learning in, in very much diagnostic capabilities today, you know, but we, we, we very seldom use uh, AI and machine learning in the operating room or the cath lab. We don't use those types of technologies to tell us where to cut, where to sew, where to cauterize tissue. We just don't. You know, and I think that there's an opportunity now to use artificial intelligence and machine learning to help us, um, you know, to make those determinations of where exactly we should be cutting, where exactly we should be sewing, where exactly we should be cauterizing tissue, and then couple that back with the GPS system thing, you know, and maybe we personalize medicine for each and every patient so that we're cutting the least amount possible. You know, we're, we're sewing the least amount possible. We're cautering, cauterizing the least amount of tissue possible for each and every patient. You know, that's really uh, the journey that uh, uh, CardioNext is, is on. So it's, it's a blast from the past. You know, it's another navigation type technology from, that I've been doing since I was 21. But now it's also um, adding the AI and machine learning capability. So what the, the first market that we're going after is in uh, atrial fibrillation. And that's, that's a condition where the top chambers of your heart really sort of shiver and don't flush blood out of your heart. So if they're, if they're kind of, if blood's pooling, then the blood can clot it can, and then travel to your brain and cause, uh, cause a stroke. So obviously that's, that's terrible. And um, we, we would like to, you know, there's, there's huge impacts to uh, society and patients uh, because of stroke and, and the five times correlation with atrial fibrillation. So we, we want to make a difference there and we want to um, find the sources uh, that are causing atrial fibrillation to persist in these patients. You know, we want to use machine learning, artificial intelligence to find the right source of tissue that's actually causing the atrial fibrillation to persist in these patients uh, and, and then use our GPS system to get an instrument to those spots and um, cauterize them, burn them. Um, so that they're not uh, causing the fibrillation of, of the heart. That's, that's really what we're doing at CardioNext, and here's you know, a, a newer version of our software, and this is a, a, actually a right atrium, and our, uh, that catheter, that, that silver thing that's bobbing around, that's a catheter that's inside someone's heart that was introduced from a uh, femoral axis. It's going up into your heart, and we're navigating it like, like a car. You know, it's a GPS system. We're navigating that, that instrument inside the heart and, and helping the physician draw a line, in this case, of cauterized uh, tissue. So that's what um, CardioNext is, is up to. But now, let's get to the pirate's life stuff, right? Um, so I told you a little bit about Cardionex. Now, um, you know, in thinking about this, I just kind of wanted to give you um, my lessons learned as, as an entrepreneur 
and, and hopefully, you know, these are helpful to you. Um, and, and I mean, I, I really sort of believe this, you know, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, if you're going to be a pirate, you know, you, you better be ready um, to, to knife fight. It's, it's a really um, difficult path. You know, I, it's, I think in today's society, we're, we're sort of glamorizing entrepreneurship a little bit. You know, it's ugly. It's, it's very uh, difficult. It takes longer than you think. It takes more money than you think. There are really, really depressing lows and, and really, really, um, you know, awesome highs, but, but they happen over and over and over again. So I'm going to give you a couple of the lessons learned uh, from, from my perspective. And the number one thing, Number one thing, live where you can be happy, okay? These things always take longer than you, you expect. They always, you know, have twists and turns, and, and you, you think someone's going to buy you for $500 million, and, and then that deal evaporates, and then you got to go back and do it again and adapt and move on and whatever. You know, I'm just saying that these things always take longer than, than you expect, and you have to be able to go home, you know, to a happy family. You have to be able to go home and spend time with the people that you care about and do things that you enjoy together. And, you know, this concept of working 24 hours a day on your startup and nothing else matters, uh, that's complete BS, okay? Because these things take way longer than, than you ever expect and you need to have some sanity, you know, you need to have a foundation that you can, you can really be happy uh, as you're building a company. Um, you know, for me, you know, we, we started my first company, Viren Medical, here in, in Nashville, and we took $5 million from, you know, uh, and we were very happy here in Nashville. We took $5 million from, you know, a couple of VCs in St. Louis, and we moved the company to St. Louis. It was miserable, absolutely miserable, absolutely miserable. And I uh, would never have taken that $5 million in retrospect. So, you know, we're, CardioNext is in Boulder where we can, my, my wife's happy, my kids are happy, we, we ski, we fish, we enjoy the sunshine, we, you know, that's really, really important. That's the number one thing that I would say. Uh, number two thing is don't sell your company without getting paid for it, okay? Don't sell your company without getting paid for it. And, you know, investors play this game where, you know, they, they get on your board and they take preferred stock and, you know, um, special voting rights and board seats and things like that and liquidation preferences where, you know, their stock gets paid multiples of the amount they invested before, before your common stock gets paid, right? Be careful. Uh, and look, I'm not saying anything bad about VCs or anything like that. I'm just saying that as a founder, as an entrepreneur, protect yourself. You know, because, you know, 100, 200, 300 million, 350 million dollar exit, you know, might only look like, you know, 50 million dollars to that's being spread amongst the people that were there at the beginning, you know, because of all the liquidation stacks and all the preferences and things like that that are going to the last round of investors, right? So you got to be very careful. And look, anybody in this room can call me anytime and I will help you review a term sheet, right? Because I'm passionate about protecting uh, entrepreneurs. And, and you really need to understand term sheets. You really need to understand, uh, you know, all of these uh, preferences and things that stack up above you as the founder, as the, the entrepreneur. Because these big numbers, you know, like my first company, $340 million, that sounds like, whoa, you know. But, but then it gets crunched down into what you actually get to participate in and what the early people get to participate in. So you got to be very, very careful, you know, when, when you're raising capital not to sell your company, you know, without selling your company. If you're going to sell it, make sure you get paid for it. Um, the next thing is um, really about team unity. And there's so many, there's so much value in having a team that's united. And I'm, I'm anti work from home, okay? I think everybody needs to be in the office because there's so much, uh, especially if you're a pirate ship and you think, you, you know, you're trying to go, 
you know, beat the Johnson and Johnsons of the world, you know, the, the huge companies of the world, you know, with a team of like 15, 16, 20 people, you know, you better be like around the cooler every single day talking, you know, sharing your experiences, sharing what you think the product needs to do, what the flaws are and, and the reality of it all. And, and honestly, in, in our team environment, I, I tell people, look, if you're going to come work for our company, uh, it's like the matrix. You can take the red pill or you can take the blue pill, right? And if you want the blue pill, go away. I, we, we can't give you the blue pill. You know, take the red pill, you come, come work with us, and you'll know everything. Everybody in our company knows how much cash we have. Everybody in our company knows you know, what our runway is. Everybody in our company knows like, what, what, the, what we have to achieve you know, to extend our runway and be successful. I, I just think that, that that really sort of manifests a unity. It's like carbon fiber. We're woven together. You know, we're, we're really impenetrable. We're like carbon fiber. And that team unity is, is necessary for teams to perform. You know, you can't, in a startup of, you know, 20 people, you can't have people performing less than 100%. You need people performing better than 100%. Right? Not like at a big company where you know, if, you can, if you're lucky to get you know, 75% performance out of somebody, that's great. No, no, no. When you only have like 20 people, everybody's got to be like above and beyond. And the way that you do that is through you know, full transparency and bonding. And you know, everybody feels like you know, we're together in this, in this mission to you know, change the world. And, and that's why I, I really think you know, this, everybody's got to be in the office together. So um, the final thing that I would say is um, recognize like you're here at an amazingly prestigious institution. You're, you're part of a, 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 just a vast community and a network, right? As Vanderbilt alumni, as Vanderbilt people associated with Vanderbilt, we have right, the CEO of NASDAQ is a Vanderbilt alumnus, right? Uh, Jamie Dimon's right hand at JP Morgan is a Vanderbilt alumnus, right? We have, we have our fingers in everything. We have, you know, from, air, from airline industry to industrials to banking to, to you know, stock exchanges, right? Vanderbilt is an amazing, amazing uh, brand. It's an amazing network, and, and now, you have a tool to access it. It's called LinkedIn. Like, use it. Use it. Get, get in touch with the Vanderbilt network. It is, is an incredibly powerful network. You know, for my first company, the first $2 million that I, you know, raised, it was, it was from Vanderbilt alumni. My second company, the first $1 million I raised, it was a one check from one guy that was um, a Vanderbilt alumnus. So please, please recognize that you know, Vanderbilt is a special place, and, and I really believe this. Like, I'm not just saying this because I'm here talking to you. you know, this is a special place for me. You know, I came here as like a hardcore programmer you know, with like, wore, wore like geeky shirts with computer science stuff on it and like had spiky hair and like whatever. But in this place really sort of transformed me. You know? Vanderbilt is a very, very special place that, that is very near and dear to my heart. And, uh, I, and, I, and I, just, I just love it. And I think it's, it's an amazing network that is incredibly powerful as well. So I really, really encourage you to, uh, to reach out into the Vanderbilt community and, and use that for your entrepreneurial efforts. So. That is uh, about all I have for you guys today. So thank you very much to everybody, and good luck with all your ventures.